thanks very much for coming and thanks to the library for having us. Um, I think my first time on the stage was in Gorey. It was 52 years ago and um, it was a production of Murder in the Cathedral. I think it was directed by Martin Armstrong. I remember Helen Hardy being in it and um, Paul Fund was overseeing the whole thing and my job, just in case you think I got on the stage, was to hold the light from the side of the stage. Do not appear, just hold the light at all times. Um, I don't know why the light couldn't be held by a machine, but anyway, I'll never forget that chorus, does the birds sing in the south, only the seabirds cry, driven inland by the storm, and this being, this being said by a chorus in unison to a full house in what was effectively the backyard of the fungus, um, of the fungus shop, and it was the first time I really saw paintings properly. It was the first time I heard a lot of music, and it was the, it was the first place I was published in a famous magazine called The Gory Detail. And it's, it's marvelous that there's a street called after Paul Funge because he did change all our lives. I mean, all of us who came here to do various things in Gory in those years in the 1970s. So it's actually great being back on the stage 52 years later. Um, so just at the beginning, um, how did this story, where did you hear this story first? Um, can I just echo uh, Colm's thanks for, um, to everybody for, be, for being here tonight and to the library for having us and the Arts Council, Audrey, everybody has been so helpful. And it's lovely to be here uh, with Colm, who is an old friend and one of the people who would have encouraged me very strongly when I was starting out and writing myself. And he's a very generous man who's helped many writers along the way. And it's, I, it's nice to be able to thank him publicly. Um, for, for doing that. So when I was getting going as a writer, maybe 35 years ago now, I was living in Lewisham in southeast London. And uh, it, was a, it was a grim old life at the time. I was entering literary competitions, getting nowhere, trying to get stuff published. I'd go down every morning and put my latest short story in an envelope into the post box. And it seemed to me that by the time I got back to the flat, um, it would already have been returned, you know, if it was going to be returned at all. And there was a, a newspaper at the time called the Irish Post, which is for uh, Irish immigrants to the UK. And they ran a literary competition every year. And the prize was that you got to attend Listowel Writers Week, the world famous Writers Week. So there was a short fiction category and a journalism category. And I entered both and I won neither. And one night I came into the dingy bedsit and on the, the kind of 1980s answering machine that used to have the flashing digit to show the number of calls. Unusually, there was one. And I pressed the button and the voice would have been recognizable to anyone in Ireland at the time, because it was the voice of the great John B. Keane, who had rung my flat. And he, he said, OK, so you didn't win the journalism. You didn't win the short story. But so why don't you come over anyway to Listowel Writers Week? And Kerry is full of O'Connors. I am married to an O'Connor. You know, you probably, if you look into the genealogy, you probably own Carrigafoyle Castle, you know, down the road, the ancient seat of the O'Connors. Come on over to Listowel. So I didn't, but I went the following year. And I think it was on that trip late at night, probably in John B.'s bar, that somebody told me, not the story, but about this character, this man, Hugh O'Flaherty, who was born in Kishkeen in County Cork, but grew up in Kerry and very much thought of himself as a Kerry person. And Kerry people are rightly very proud of him. He was a school master in his early 20s and then he became a catholic priest he's a bright man um he had three he would achieve three phds in the course of his career he spoke six or seven languages and he went off to work in rome in the curia which is like the vatican civil service and so hugh is in the vatican in the late 1930s uh, and second world war starts and the nazis invade many places in Europe, including Italy, closer and closer to Rome. And Hugh realizes that if you're in the Vatican, and people will know this yourselves, anyone who's been to Rome, the Vatican is an independent country. It's a little enclave within the city of Rome. Um, became independent in 1929, one of the world's smallest countries. 
about a sixth of a square mile and neutral in the Second World War. So Hugh realizes, I am here and if I can put together a little group of people to help refugees, Roman Jews, mainly escaped allied prisoner, uh, prisoners of war, who've managed to get out of the fascist prisoner of war camps, the length and breadth of Italy. And if they can make it into the Vatican, I can help them. So he put himself in the way of enormous danger. I mean, there's absolutely no doubt that Hugh's priesthood would not have saved him from the Gestapo, who during their 10 month reign of terror uh, in Rome murdered at least two Catholic priests that we know of. But time and again, he put himself into danger to save people. We think it may be as many as 7,000 uh, people. And one of the things that really interested me about him is he's from Kerry and he comes of age in the 1920s. So there's war of independence and there's demonology and there's understandable reluctance and fear and dislike of British soldiers, but mainly the people who he comes to help uh, in the early 1940s in Rome are young British conscripts who found themselves in this war, some of them still teenagers. Um, so he's one of those people who leave the tribe. And I find people who leave the tribe fascinating. The other thing about him, of course, from a storyteller's point of view, that makes him very attractive, is the things that we don't know about him. You know, and I've written before a couple of times about real historical figures where there's a silence. You know, I, I wrote a novel about um, John Singh and his love affair with Molly Allgood, where we only have one half of the correspondence. And I wrote a novel inspired by Bram Stoker. Um, it's a wonderful man, but, but a life full of shadows. I mean, we don't, there's so many things we still don't know about Stoker. And because Hugh's work was largely, of course, conducted in secret, there are a lot of things we don't know about him. So I found those silences very attractive. And in a way, the more I read about him over the years, the less I felt I knew. But I had a sense of him uh, as, as a person. And, and the way it kind of works with me is I, I always have three or four ideas circling for novels. You know, I don't wait for the muse to come and get me. It's, I kind of feel I'm like the air traffic control tower, you know, at Dublin airport. And they're flying around and occasionally you reach out and you grab one. And there was something about the COVID lockdown um, that intensified the character of Hugh and his struggles, something to do with borders and boundaries and all of us being suddenly circumscribed. You remember yourself how frightening the first COVID lockdown was. We didn't know about COVID then, what, what we know now. It's suddenly, you know, you're in a five kilometer distance and then it's a two kilometer distance. And now you're living in a free country, but the police can stop you and ask you where you're going. And all the way through Hugh's story, there are these images of, of borders and boundaries. You know, there's a literal red line painted around the edge of St. Peter's Square to delineate the border between the Vatican and Italy. And you put your foot over that line, you're in a concentration camp. You know, it, 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 it's that simple. So you're surrounded by orders and commands and surveillance and fear and boundaries. And I had already started the novel. But at the time of the lockdown, it, I just found, I found it energizing in a way. I found that I wanted to go to this story every day. And that's what I did. I sat down and I wrote, you know, a thousand words or 1500 words every day. And the story began to kind of amass itself. Um, so it was, it was, it was a, a, a gift of the terrible time that was the lockdown. And then the story just, just kind of arrived. And then I started to piece together different elements of it. You know, Hugh's working with a small group of uh, seven other people who are from very different backgrounds. I mean, again, it's one of the interesting things about this story. This is not eight Catholic priests. You know, there, there's Hugh, there's a um, fascinating woman, Delia Murphy, who some people will remember as, as a balladeer, a folk singer, kind of pioneer of Irish music. I was talking to John Kelly, <clears throat> from RTE a while ago about Delia and he told me that in 1940s Ireland Delia was the nearest thing we had to a pop star and yeah, she yeah, yeah. she made albums and she went on tours and she you know she was her music was played all over Europe so she's in Rome because she is married to um, a man called Thomas Kiernan who's the I Ireland's ambassador to the Holy See um, so she's put her career as a singer on hold because of his 
posting. Um, so he's the ambassador of a neutral country. We're not supposed to be involved in this conflict at all. But Delia decides she's going to side with Hugh and she becomes very involved in the escape line. So there's, there's her, there's, you know, some of the people in the escape line are Jewish, some are, you know, there's Sir Hugh Osborne, who's the British ambassador to Rome, who is, you know, a public school educated aristocrat, the future Duke of Leeds. So he becomes an important friend of Hugh. Um, Osborne's butler, a cockney jazz musician called John May, um, who's Jewish, he gets involved. So it's a very interesting and diverse group. The women in the escape line, hugely important. Um, and it's part of his leadership is to be able to put together this group who really agree on very little, uh, apart from their great love of the city of Rome and their desire to stand up for what we would now term human rights, although that's not a term that Hugh uh, would have you would have used just some attempt to do the right thing and they're living in a very very frightening dangerous um, world where they are surrounded by people telling them to stop you know we have the nazis literally at the end of the square i mean if you were to go to where if you drove here tonight where you turned in off the main street outside tonight that's where the panzer tanks are you have the vatican authorities saying to hugh look we're a neutral country the Pope is saying, I don't want a pretext for the tanks rolling into the square, uh, the swastika flying from the Dome of St. Peter's. We're neutral. This is going to have to stop. Um, and you have the Dublin government back, back in Ireland being very, very angry about Hugh of Laherty's work and warning him all the time to lay off. You know, we, this is a new country and we have only been in legal existence for 20 years. And we only have the freedom that we have coming out of decades of violence. And what Ireland needs is 50 years where there are schools and local government and courtrooms and a police force that works. And we cannot handle Luftwaffe attacks on Athlone and Dublin and Cork. Uh, you don't have a monopoly on you know, being a good guy. You'll have to stop. And there's a chilling... Um, Telegram, which anybody can read, it's in the, it's online in the archive of Department of Foreign Affairs from a representative in the Taoiseach's office saying, if, if you don't stop your work, you're going to end up in a concentration camp. And the Taoiseach thinks that might actually do you some good, right? So th this is the who Irish said, government saying to an Irish Who citizen, sent that? I, I, I can't remember the name, it's sourced in the back of the book. So, and, and, and I think with, with Hugh, that there must have been days when he wanted to stop himself. Like, I'm always at pains to say about him, this is not like a radical guy. He's an obedient Catholic priest. He's not what we would now term, you know, a liberation theologian. He's a rather conservative man. But I think he just has the kind of moral compass where he's not able to stop. It's the kind of courage that in our era, people my age would remember the great day Nelson Mandela was released from prison. It's something of that, of Mandela saying to white South Africa, well, look, do your thing. You know, if you, if you need to put me in a prison cell for 26 years, you do that. I'm going to continue to do what I do. And I, and I think that's the kind of person Hugh was, that it's a passionate commitment to human rights, but it's also something deeper. Um, it's a kind of a struggle with the self. Um, and then he's such an attractive person to write about because in real life, he's, he's, he's such an interesting, chatty, witty man. He's a very complete person. He, he loves the opera. He loves poetry. He also loves boxing. He loves golf. He, he has friends who are women, friends who are men of very different outlooks. He's an unjudgmental, kind of charming person. I, I've read all of his surviving correspondence well, I mean, perhaps the trove of correspondence I was shown had been gone through already. But he emerges such a warm, kind of witty man. He loves the gossip from back in Kerry. Who's going out with who? Um, he's got an endearing um, little fondness for um, asking people to send him uh, tickets for the Irish hospital sweepstakes and hoping that he might win on the, on, on the sweepstakes. I'm sure he would have given the money to charity if he did. Um, uh, and uh, I, so I, I had a, a lovely morning interviewing his nephew, who's judge, former judge of the Supreme Court, Hugh O'Flaherty, the only person I've met who actually met 
Monsignor Hugh, and Judge Hugh, when he was a kid, when he was 15 and 16, the summer holidays where he would go over to the Vatican and stay with um, Uncle Hugh. And I was always very interested because um, one of the things that you come up against when you're writing about a very good person is that they're very good. And the, the biographies of him and representations of him make him seem a bit saintly. But as every writer knows, you, you need to know your character's flaws too, because they won't work if they're saints. So I, I spent a lot of the morning saying to Judge Hugh, yeah, but come on, you know, there must have been something about him that was, and he was very loyal and very loving. He didn't want to tell me, but finally towards the end of the morning, he said, well, look, okay. Um, he had been a school teacher uh, and, and he could be a bit schoolmasterly, you know, and if he lost, if he ran out of patience with you, he could be a bit bossy and a bit authoritarian. Imagine such a thing as an Irish priest being a bit bossy and authoritarian yeah, yeah. at that time. And I, I, I went home just very happy because I now thought, oh, ah. yeah, no, I, ha I have something now that I can actually um, give. I just want to ask you, just, just, just before you read us a bit of the book, um, about um, four or five books in, as you were writing, you did something which seems to me really important in, and also in the making of this book, is that you saw that the making of any story would get more energy if you gave it a number of perspectives. Yeah. In other words, if novels like Redemption Falls started to see, you bring in things that seem real documents or another person's voice or a, an actual omniscient narrator in the middle of all this. So that as you turn into each chapter, something different happens. So you're talking about Hugh O'Flaherty and, and his story. But in fact, you're talking about what Derval and Murphy had to say about the whole thing, what you know, the ambassador had to say, what the Contessa had to say. And it's not that they're competing narratives, because, because it's not as though one of them is more unreliable than the other. But they are, what it is as though that, that you're working with a sort of mosaic hmm. and that the story comes together by the different colors you paint rather than coming into the book with a single narrator telling a single story that moves seamlessly. That, that's, that way of narrating seemed to that it, it ceased to interest you um, as a yeah. way of telling the story. Yes, it did. I mean, I, I, I ran out of patience with it and I, I ran out of possibility with it. And the reason is because the novel I was writing at the time, Star of the Sea, um, I felt couldn't have been written that way because Star of the Sea is tw 20 years old this year to my power. But uh, it's a, gr a great big long book, 450 page long book uh, about the Irish famine. Uh, and it is contested territory. Still, and uh, and there are competing stories and overlapping stories. Um, so so it seemed to me that you know a, a great big novel t told in one voice could not do justice to the um, amplitude and capaciousness and noisiness and messiness that would be needed in a story like that. So I, I came up with this image of the ship. You know, it's set in a ship. It's voyaging from Liverpool via Cove to New York at the height of the famine. So I thought, well, we'll have the stories of the people in steerage, but we'll also have the stories of the people in first class. And I'm not going to demonize anybody, and I'm not going to make a hero of anyone. And then I thought there'd be interesting kind of narrative possibilities, because you could have texture. So part of it is being written by the captain on the ship. He's writing a, his, his daily kind of captain's journal that they have to write, but it's, it's jagged, it's very direct. He doesn't have a lot of time because he's running a ship. So, so it's almost written in staccato style. And then part of it is being written by a narrator, as you realize towards the end of the book, who's looking back. You know, it's 40 or 50 years later. So he's had time to assimilate. And then there are ballads and newspapers and songs and bits of dialogue. And I thought that the scrappiness of it um, would make for a more textured read. And it was a book that taught me a lot because after Star of the Sea, I continued really. Yeah with that mode um, to, to, to one degree or another. So like in this book, um, as, as I said, it's, 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 it's led by Hugh O'Flaherty, but it's a group of eight. And um, one of the things that they do, they become convinced that the Gestapo have bugged every room in the Vatican. So when they're meeting, they have to be very careful um, that they assume they're being recorded. <clears throat> so they form themselves into a choir they form themselves into a little a chamber choir and it meets on a Tuesday night and a Friday night and they rehearse. And while they're singing, I'm passing you a note about who we're going to try and rescue next week. And you're passing Delia Murphy a note about the address of this safe house. And, and anything that we're saying or whispering is being covered up by the 
the sound of the singing. And of course, then you have the lovely possibility that the people in the room singing this sacred music, uh, even if they're non-believers, the act of singing becomes sacred um, over time. So you're in an attic room in Rome. The Nazis are at the end of the street. The bombers are overhead, but we're doing this beautiful thing together. And, and so then I thought, okay, there's going to be moments when I'm going to interrupt the narrative um, of the choir, and each of them is going to have a solo. So, so every kind of 25 or 30 pages, one of the characters steps forward and they tell you their perspective mm. on this particular bit of the story, and then it goes back into third person uh, and so on. And, Can you give and, us a sample of that? Yeah, so um, it's, it's um, this is a, a bit that I, I'll, I'll just read from chapter four of, of, um, of the book. I'll stand up um, to read, if you don't mind. So this bit is actually in Hugh O'Flaherty's voice. Um, so, so if you will, it's, this is being written on the night of the 23rd of December, 1943. So we're coming up to Christmas. Hugh is in the Vatican. Um, is the sound okay? I haven't done anything. Right. <clears throat> so the city is full of rumors. There's no reliable news. You can't, to own a radio is illegal. You can't listen to BBC. You can't listen to American Forces Network. So every day there are rumors sweeping the place about what's going to happen next. And the, the current rumor is that over Christmas, the Nazis are going to invade the Vatican. So Hugh believes that this is a moment of supreme danger for, for him. And it may, he may be looking at the end of his life. So he decides he's going to take 40 minutes <clears throat> out of his work to rescue all of these people. He's going to write a document that he will arrange to have smuggled back to his family and his loved ones in Ireland just to let them know his state of mind at what he believes is the last. Um, so I'll read for that. You'd be relieved to hear I won't read for 40 minutes, but um, I'll, I'll read for a few minutes. And this is chapter four of the book. <coughs> My last will and testament. 23rd of December, 1943. Since I own almost nothing, I have little to bequeath. My books, I ask be given to my sister, Bride, my brothers, Jim and Neil, and my parents, James and Margaret, 11 Hen Street, Killarney, County Kerry, in Ireland. And I request that for three years on the date of my ordination, a mass for the forgiveness of my sins be offered in the church where I was baptized. The above is the entirety of my will. As to my testament, I should like to tell of a man I never met, an orchestral conductor, a Roman by birth, whose presence in my life, whose absence from it really, altered how I understood the world and how we are to act in it, if any single event other than the resurrection may be said to have done that. In my twenties, once a school teacher, now a student for the priesthood, I came to undertake doctoral study in Rome, having never previously left my home place. With a cabbage for a brain and the stones of rural Kerry still in my shoes, I gaped as the train pulled into Tibertina Station. The multitude of steeples, that pin-cushioned skyline. I can never forget the exhilaration of those first weeks that quartet of great and majestic basilicas in the gloaming, the hundreds of dark and beautiful churches, the food, the art, the zestful life, the many languages, the glories to be encountered in the Vatican Library. It was like awakening in a land of wonders. Rome, for me, is a painter's palette, a chiaroscuro of burnished pinks, old copper, walnut, honey, ivory, mocha. It is also its own music, a piano sonata. I can never hear Clementi without the sight of my beloved adoptive home and the pierce of a spear of longing. After periods of ministry in Palestine, New York, Haiti and other places, in my early thirties, I was summoned to return here. On the evening when I arrived, it happened that a small electrical fire had broken out at the dormitory intended to house me in a poorly modernized medieval friary. And so I and seven fellow priests were lodged in an old pensione on Via Pompeo Magno in Prati, not far from the Vatican, but far enough. 
as is the case with all marriages. Priesthood has its seasons and tides, the gravities no one warns you about. Yes, <laughs> there are the summer evenings when the stars in the sky may be stirred by the outstretch of a hand, but there are Februarys too. You'd want to father yourself when those happen. The lonesomeness of priestly life can at times freeze the heart. <coughs> My Rome thawed it out, helped me breathe again. I lived in a boarding house for pilgrims, managed by Congolese nuns who had taken <coughs> the holiest oath of all, an oath of silence. They would point you to the dining table or the sitting room in which we had a wireless, or with a pencil indicate on the map the ancient church you sought. Gentle, unsettling ladies, they ruled with their eyes. I pray God for their safety in the coming days. <coughs> there was an ease to Roman life, a taking in through the senses, the very name of the city a metaphor for patience, the place that wasn't built in a day. My walk would take me by way of the Spanish steps, where I would say a silent prayer for that haunted man, John Keats, who died in a house nearby. A sinner, as who is not, but a greater poet than Wordsworth, whom I was never able to forgive for the daffodils. The place names and direction signs were as jewels set into a mosaic, the Quirinale, the Orti Farnesiani, the Fontana di Trevi, the Arco di Constantino, Santa Maria Maggiore. To say those words aloud was to fizz. To walk the Via Cola di Rienzo or the Isles of the Mercato Rionale, the great beauty and profusion of the produce, the sweet prosciutti and bursting cheeses, the intense sensuousness of any place in Italy where food is bought or sold. To watch the handsome women going about, the mocking way they argued with the stallholders, hefting an avocado here, a stem of luscious tomatoes there, or to cool by the cascade in the Piazza Navona, to sit a while by the Tiber, not a half hour's walk from my room. Ardent lovers, hand in hand, glitter-eyed and gesturing, alive in the radiance of their need for one another, or the youths full of peaceful silences, as Italians against expectation can be, staring contentedly into a fountain. The Romans are like people stepped out of a Caravaggio, long-nosed, alluring, courtly, the street singers, the vagabonds, the bawling men arguing. A painful difficulty about happiness is that we so rarely notice its arrival. In Rome, we would soon know it was gone. In dreams, I'd often see Banna Strand or the rocks of coastal Kerry, the tiny islands like ink blots splashed by a careless cartographer. The corner of the world where I was reared is known for its stern, stark mountains and mirroring lakes, its raggedness on a map, the attack of its fiddle style, for an imperiousness of character that is sometimes mistaken for mere pride though it is something far stronger, a pagan identification with place. There is a notion of land and person as expressions of one another, translations. We carry people, our carry people first. In my childhood, the neighboring counties were lampooned and done down. Their indigenes, often our own relatives, the butt of only partly good-natured quips. Corconians think they're great. Limerick people, sanctimonious. As for derision of the capital city, that was part of the weather. Dublin was West Britain. Her citizens had sold themselves, prancing like show ponies for their overlords across the water while the overlords snickered at the effort. My father used to joke that there was only one circumstance in which he could ever bring himself to cheer for England. That would be if an English team were somehow opposing Dublin in the All-Ireland Gaelic football <laughs> final, in which unlikely eventuality, my father used to say, I'd be draped in the Union Jack. <laughs> yeah. um, Joe, if there's a hero in this book, it's the city of Rome. 
Mm. And the city of Rome is described, first of all, in extraordinary topographical detail, street after street. The whole idea that the Monsignor, Hugh O'Flaherty, knows this city uh, as, as only a man as curious and, and in a way as independent-minded as he could, little streets by little streets, but also what's under the city, how you could escape in various ways, what was bombed, what was still intact. It's, it's an extraordinary picture. I mean, I mean it's, it's, um, it, it's alive with, with topography, the book. Yeah, so, I mean, one of the very likable things about Hugh is that um, he loved walking around Rome. He loved Rome. He thought it was just great living in Rome. I thought there's a sense of that in what I read there. He loved listening to people speaking the language and watching people and the hidden history of the place and the hidden architecture of the place. And people who've been to Rome will know um, Rome is still being excavated. You walk around the Forum now, as, as we, we did only a few months ago, there's still picks and shovels in the ground. You know, there's, we went to um, a site beneath the Trevi Fountain in Rome, where anybody who's been in Rome will have been to. Um, there's the remains of a, an aqueduct system. The water is still flowing into the stone tank beneath the Trevi Fountain 2,000 years later. And nobody knows how that's happening. The archaeologists know there must be at least 14 or 15 more of these. They don't know where they are. Um, so it's a city of um, earthquakes and tunnels and catacombs and buildings just suddenly falling through the ground. And Hugh makes it his business to know about all of these. Mm. And he and the escape line um, use them. But it's also, it's an interesting, it was an interesting thing for me to use because, of course, it means it adds to the texture. You have above ground the great architectural and cultural splendor of Rome. You wander into a church that might not even be in the guidebook and there's a Caravaggio or a Giotto on the yeah, wall. Yeah. But there's also what's going on um, underneath. So, so there's Rome's face and then there's Rome's body, I suppose, would be one way of thinking about it, the tiny little streets, the Italians call them vicolo, um, that would be only one person could walk through. You couldn't ride a scooter through them. It's impossible really to map Rome completely um, for this reason. One of the things you notice when you go there even now, like very unusually for a modern European city, the metro system is extremely basic. It's an X. Um, and the reason is that you, you can't dig just anywhere because you wouldn't know what you would find. In the last few years, just while we've been going, while I'm researching this book, they found the Domos Aria buried in the hill uh, across the street from the Colosseum, um, Nero's palace. So only, only rediscovered uh, four or five years ago. The painters of the Renaissance knew about it. They're wonderful stories of people tunneling down into it by torchlight, looking at the icons and mosaics and the peacock's eyes on the wall. But for a couple of hundred years, it disappeared. People didn't even think that it was accurate. People thought that was all fiction. So the blend between what's, what, what's real and what's fictional and what's shown and what's hidden um, is, 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 is very flexible in Rome. And that, that made an interesting place to, to, to write about because you have a lot of textures to play with. It, it, it's, a, it's an ominous, frightening book in that you're constantly aware how high the price that would be paid by anyone who was caught. There's a constant sense of the most savage tortures going on and of, of people being taken up for the smallest reason. Obviously, people who are Jewish are being taken, but anyone suspected of communism or breaking the curfew. And, and they're just, what, what's interesting is how subtly you deal with this in that there's no big set scene within the torture chamber where this is going on. You don't do that. You, 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 it's, it's throughout the book. It's done by a set of signs and mentions. So you know what's going on all the time as other things are happening in this building. Hmm. The most savvy things are going. But, but, if you, but you must have consciously decided, I'm not going to do one big set vicious torture scene. No, because I thought, like you're, you're, you're saying, I, I hope it's true, that the, the city of Rome is a character oh, yeah. in the book. And that's certainly what I tried to do but also that fear is a character. F fear is something that you wake up with every day in this world over these 10 months um, in Rome. There might be a few seconds when you wake up and it's a, 
it's a beautiful October morning and the nightingales are singing outside. You might have five or 10 seconds when you forget about it. And then reality dawns and um, there are the Nazis and the tanks and all of that. But there's also there's other stuff that I'm going to be dealing with. This is the first book of a trilogy I'm going to be dealing with in the next couple of books. Huge things about food. Um, it's very interesting for an Irish writer who's written about the famine to write about. By the time you get to January or February <coughs> 1944, there are almost famine-like conditions in Rome. People are falling down in the street and dying in the streets of Rome because the Nazis... Um, run the black market and there's the constant thing you play ball with us and there'll be something to eat today and you decide not to that's fine enjoy your heroism there'll be nothing to eat um so a lot about control and use of rationing as as a weapon and all of that but at the same time at the center of the book i hope this enormous goodness and this enormous humanity that says like even in this awful situation and they, and they know all the time, we can't save everyone. That there will be the days when we can't save anyone. But if five people turn up in St. Peter's Square tomorrow, we're going to save them. And we'll put ourselves at risk to do it because we cannot live with ourselves otherwise. So, so, so you know, it's the terrible world and the beautiful world. And there's the, the world of the Nazis, but there's also the Sistine Chapel and there's Verdi, the beautiful things that we've done. And the amazing things that we do together, like all the great things that we do are actually the things that we do together. And I suppose the choir was, was a way of dramatizing rather than just describing that. Because a choir can only work if you go quiet for those eight bars and I'll sing louder for those 16 and this, we'll, we'll have the soprano and the alto and then we'll have everybody and then we'll have a solo. It can only work by everybody doing it. But I, I think that works also in the way that you do the voices, where um, in the Delia Murphy section, which is towards the beginning, where she gets to speak, you can actually hear Irish being translated by her. She uses after, you know, I'm after being sick, I'm after going down. But she doesn't use it, it isn't as though she uses it too much, but it is that there, there is a sense of flavor in her voice of a living speech. Yeah. And then you, I think you really, I mean, I know you like Hugh, we all like him, but the the English guy May the the um, I, I feel in his tongue that you really enjoyed him I, I and loved, loved his tolerance, his how, the fact that he was ugly and sexy, the fact that he you know he, he knew his way around the city in a whole different way. I felt you got that in when he spoke in the book in, in his voice. Well, um, like I, I love listening to people's voices, and I, you know I. I, I th- I sometimes think that when literature strays too far from the spoken word, it begins to lose something that it can can only be compensated for by huge artistry and ability to build up energy in the sentence and a whole set of skills that other people probably do better than I do. But if you if you're able to convey on the page the flavor of how somebody talks, all sorts of wonderful things happen. For the reader, it's very hard to completely resist the first person voice um, if it's done convincingly because it's somebody telling you their story. And I mean, Delia was such fun to play with because she's mischievous. You know, Hugh is a bit saintly and Delia is a Catholic, but, you know, sceptical. And she says, you know, I go to Mass, but I wouldn't be a Holy Mary. I wouldn't be a great one for eight in the altar rails, you know. And there's great people of every faith, but there's 24 carat bastards as well, you know. So she's, she's, there's no flies in her. And then Johnny, Johnny May, this Cockney character who did, did intrigue me. I, I mentioned this is the first book of a trilogy. So the final one, Johnny May is the central oh, character. Great. Oh, good. Um, and he, he's kind of apolitical. You know, to some extent, he was born Jewish, but is not involved in in in, in the war, or so he thinks. Um, he was a nightclub bouncer uh, back in Soho in the late 1930s, kind of decadent nightclub scene. He's seen it all. You know, nothing that you can do is going to bother him. Um, very much, he he goes loves jazz, loves mischief as Colm says, has his own kind of way of moving around the city that nobody knows anything about. I, I really got his voice from when I went to live in London in the 1980s. So I lived in South East London 
and uh, used to go to a pub in Newcross with a friend of mine and play pool. And there'd be our lads, our London guys sitting at the bar, you know, the 70s or 80s. And inevitably they'd get to talking about the Germans, you know, the fucking Germans. Uh, two, uh, two, uh, two world wars and one World Cup. That's what I say to the fucking Germans. But slightly tongue in cheek, you know, you sort of felt they didn't really mean it. Yeah. Um, but there was a, there was a flowriness and a great colour to that South East London Cockney speech, which is a completely different set of tones from, from Delia or from Hugh or from the third person narrator. So it's, it's an attempt to say, look, like the world is full of beauty. Even the way people speak is full of beauty. I have an accent. You have an accent. Johnny May has an accent. It's not the same as, 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 as Hugh's. Um, there's something in that something in the performance of speech that is almost um, to do with art in itself. Brian, Brian um, Eno, a great artist and musician and soundscape man, says that whenever he's talking to students who say people aren't naturally artistic, he says, well, why do we have hairstyles? You know, there's no reason for anybody to have a hairstyle. But, uh, <laughs> well, okay, we're, myself and Colin have, have, have a similar <laughs> one now. But, but, you know, there's something in how we speak that expresses uh, us, yeah. the usness of okay. us, you know, and we love that in Ireland. You know, we're very, very aware of that in Ireland. Um, just a final question before we go to the, um, to the readers. Um, the book, besides telling the story from different perspectives, also takes different perspectives. So there's a, there's a moment early in the book where the Monsignor, where he goes to see a camp, and he, he, he behaves, he makes clear, he wants to humiliate the guards and make clear his solidarity with the prisoners who are British prisoners of war. And you think, well, that's good, you know, and then you realize, oh, when he's told later, that caused nothing but trouble. Doing that sort of, sort of, I suppose it's called showboating, you know, doing that sort of thing is good for you, but it didn't end up well. And there's, there are also moments where you see, especially the Nazis, for, for a moment, they're humanized. Mm. And they're given wives, children, mm. hopes, fears, love of nature. And so that you're, you're, you're constantly being wrong footed if you think you're in a sort of purely mor in, in, a, in a clear moral universe that's in which, so. you know, th things are clear. Sorry, that's not a good question. But, but that obviously this is something I think that really matters to you. Yeah, it does. Because um, we, we have a whole set of tricks that we play with ourselves to make the understanding of evil a bit easier. And, and one of them is that, that um, the Nazis were monsters. They're not like us. They, they did these terrible things and we're very different from them. Um, so there's a kind of stock character Nazi who any writer can take off the shelf. I mean, there are probably novels, you know, around the place where, you know, the, 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 there's the cold-hearted, vicious, brutal Nazi. He's blonde. He's got a dueling scar, you know, usually. And that's that's fine. But to me, the terrifying thing um, about the adversaries Hugh is facing is that they're human beings. You know, it's terrifying that this man who leads the Gestapo in Rome um, has a wife who he loves and he has two children who he loves and he clowns around with them at Christmas and he's drinking them, drinking chocolate and, you know, making the little foam moustache and they're laughing at daddy. You know, they think daddy's yeah, hilarious. Yeah. And then daddy goes into work the next day and he tortures people. And then he comes home and he's very nice and he plays with the kids again. So uh, apart from the fact that it's morally truer, I thought it would be far more frightening for Hugh. That you, you're, yeah. you're, not, you're not facing a bogeyman out of a, a movie. That this is a real person who has now invested himself in a situation that's gone too far. You know, there are little moments when you're inside this character's head where he speculated what might have happened if I didn't do that yeah. you know but now I've signed up and mm. there's nowhere else to go except to stay on this road uh, and, and Hugh I wouldn't say he has a sympathy for him but he has a kind of understanding for what this man's situation is mm. and I, I deal with that in a particular way at the end of the book which we, won't, which, which we won't give away you, yeah. so um, thank you very much for coming and thank you especially to Joe O'Connor for being so articulate and brilliant Thank you.